we're, we're getting it together up here. <laughs> Hello, all. Thank, thank you for, for being here. I also want to add a little bit to my biography. I grew up not too far from, from Terrence. I was born and raised in Denver in the Park Hill neighborhood and somehow found my way up here as a professor. Um, but uh, a little bit of a different story <laughs> than Terrence. And so what we'd like to start with is for Julian to give us an overview of the book and then move to Terrence. So. Sure. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to the Jaipur Literature Festival, especially bringing it to Boulder and allowing us to, uh, to be able to partake in it here and for you guys to come. Um, I, uh, so just in brief, you know, I came, I'd grown up in Denver, so I'd, I'd looked for this, I'd, I'd come across this story in 2013, soon after uh, the shooting that's at the heart of the book and the film um, took place. And I first had reached out and I was able to reach Terrence because he was out on bond awaiting trial. And the things that sort of, you know, brought me to it and then became much sort of larger, which really drew me into it, were first, you know, Terrence and uh, someone who to me was so symbolic of the struggle black men have really been going through for decades, generations, even centuries now in this country. And it was so like alive in him what was going, what, it, what he seemed to me that I felt that that alone was interesting for me to try to like figure out how that fit into this setting and in this story that happened. And the setting and the story was that he had been leading the redevelopment of this landmark civil rights era kind of, you know, landmark, which actually had been this, you know, the site of a famous shooting in 1968 that's chronicled in the book earlier on. The reason that the book became a multi-generational story was because of all of the cycles that I started to see um, running in this story, uh, particularly, I guess I would say, of activism, of violence, and of uh, uh, sort of significant um, uh, interest and, and uh, involvement of law enforcement in the neighborhood. And then over the years as well, the sort of misperceptions about the neighborhood and this effort by the city actually to redevelop it for over, over the years and how it, how it had changed. Um, so in any case, all of these reasons were for me really why I wanted to you know try to figure out, which is what I thought I was doing at first, what happened on this particular day, why this guy was leading a redevelopment effort would shoot someone at his own peace rally. And then ultimately, uh, the fact that as I started to report on this story, I thought I was not only covering a crime that had sort of happened and what trying to figure out what had happened, but that I was sort of standing in the middle of a crime in progress. And so I started, you know, filming actually. And that is not only the sort of third act of the book, but that's much of the documentary. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, having said all that, it's it's been uh, amazing, and none of this would ever have been able to have happened were not for the man on my rights, you know, willingness and openness to work with me because I was working as a journalist. I wasn't working as someone who just wanted to tell his story or his side of the story, but he did open up his life as anyone who, you know, has read the book or will see the documentary will see. Um, and so I'll throw it over to Terrence to talk about what it might have been like to why he wanted to do this story or or, or what that was like. Well, at the time, can can I ask a question? Has anybody in the audience read the book yet? Okay, well, a few people. Well, make sure you do get it. You could get an audio, audible too. But so you will see in the book if you haven't read it that when I had to defend myself, the local media in Denver were interviewing the same gang members who Julian has literally on camera attacking me. So um, they were letting them make character references about who I am, about my attitude before the incident happened. So mind you, I just had to defend my very life against these men. Now they're <laughs> in mainstream media talking about me to the world. So I was not talking to local media, but I still had to have some kind of voice because I was defending myself. Um, I mean, I was looking at life in prison, but I couldn't talk to the same media sources who were interviewing active gang members. And um, when Julian emailed me, of course, I, you know, I vetted him the same way he vetted me. I looked up, I seen that he was a professional journalist. 
um, that he worked for all these different outlets. And I didn't need him to tell only my side of the story. I just needed any person to just tell the truth about what happened because obviously I was innocent. All of my jurors thought the same thing. That's why I'm sitting here. And um, I just needed to have a voice because they were just really burying me in uh, slanderous media. Thank you, Julian and Terrence. Uh, Terrence, if you could give a brief, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that's possible. The book is very long, and Julian, I think you said it could have been even longer, and I would have read it. I would have read the 800-page book. It's not page that book. long, long. <laughs> don't get too afraid. I think it's No, don't be afraid. Just take it in parts. Um, it, it needed to. It needed to be the length that is. Um, because there, it's, it's, as you mentioned, complicated, and, and we can't be ahistorical. We have to talk about the history in that neighborhood, the history of blacks. Um, a lot of people assume that there aren't even blacks or African Americans in Denver, and so that history needed to be told, and I really appreciate that. But Terrence, if you could talk about, just briefly, um, your experience from growing up, uh, um, uh, you mentioned as you were honor roll student and then you became a member of the Park Hill Bloods and then you went to prison and then you mm -hmm. came out and you were an activist. So if you could uh, talk a little bit more about that, for, particularly for those people who haven't had a chance to read the book yet. Yeah, I grew up in Northeast Denver in the Park Hill area where pretty much if you know about the area of Park Hill, it's kind of like the square area that's a couple of miles northeast of downtown Denver, so it's just like its own little village. Uh, this portion of Park Hill where I grew up, there's kind of two portions. It's like a south portion where it's more affluent people, but then the north portion was literally almost 100% African American. And it was like this African American village that was, it was almost, you know, you talk about the 70s and the early 80s, it was almost something that you would see on television. It was like this perfect little African American village where everything was black owned, black ran. Um, you know, there were street gangs, but we didn't have 96 homicides like we did in Denver last year. <laughs> Back then, maybe there was two or three or something. And I was a kid, so I was far, I didn't notice any of that other than some scuffles and fights where people just, you know, got into a fight. But there was like this community pride in Park Hill where, uh, as Dr. Potter can tell you, if you're from Park Hill, you know, there's like this level of um, competition of, of just doing things well, no matter what you put your name on, you know, because these were hardworking African Americans, mainly from Louisiana, they came from Texas, and they came from Arkansas. My family came from Arkansas. So it was like all of, and I would say it was a matriarchal community. Park Hill was mainly ran by African American women who worked very hard and they didn't take any crap from anybody. So as we move on to the more the mid to late 80s, um, I went from you know loving to go to school, doing my homework, but then of course we got gangster rap, came into town. Um, it was like an explosion or a movement of youth wanting to be a crip or a blood, or just you know you gotta be tough. And you know, either you could play football very well and we knew you were going to the NFL, there was no doubt, or you were Chauncey Billups, or it was like, stay in school and good luck with that, or you know, if you were gonna be outside. At that time, there were thousands of gang members in the city of Denver hanging out, roaming the streets, and you know, for community pride, I joined the Bloods. Not because I wanted to be a bad kid, but that's where the parties were. That was who was holding, I was a youth. There were no youth programs doing parties like the Bloods were. There were no youth programs having picnics and barbecues like the Bloods were. And even I say now, if the Bloods or Crips are cooler than your after school program, you can't blame a child for joining a street gang because we have adults joining negative peer groups looking for camaraderie and attention. How much more would a 12 year old child or 14 year old child join a negative peer group for camaraderie? We're humans, it's scientifically proven human need human interaction. So I joined the Bloods um, just to really hang out with my friends and represent Park Hill, but of course we were gang members. We were getting shot. Other people were getting shot. We started doing negative things, which landed me, I got shot in my back in the summer of violence of 93. Um, I actually got shot again before um, I even healed up from that gunshot wound and I went to prison uh, off and on for the next 10 years. And I really just wanted to be back to my regular self. Like, my name is Terrence, I like going to school, I like learning, and I don't, don't really wanna pretend to be this tough, mean, menacing person because that's really not who I am. So um, I left the gang system and it was working very well 
for quite a few years until certain, a certain group, and I'm not saying all law enforcement because I'm not against law enforcement, but there was a particular group of law enforcement officers who teamed up with a certain group of gang members and activists to derail me. Other than that, I would be building playgrounds right now and I never would have met Julian, so. Thank you. And maybe Julian, if you could um, talk about it from your perspective, um, uh, a little bit more about what brought you into the story. What was the, the incident that brought you into the story? And again, from your perspective. Uh, one, one of the things, I mean, just listening to Terrence, it was reminding me again, just, you know, you, I think you both mentioned it about um, what the depiction was of the neighborhood or, or, or even, uh, as Dr. Potter's mentioned, growing up there and learning some things in the book. I mean, the, the, the education of kids in, in black Denver especially, I mean, there's reasons why I think particularly that group's history is not well chronicled, you know? And it continued to not be well chronicled. Um, and so many of the things that Terrence is talking about were of course totally fascinating to me and I grew up in Denver and I didn't know any of these things and many others who've been around me and, and even when I was reporting on the story literally for a while, and again, for those of you who've read the book, you know more about what this means, but like people did not believe what I was like finding out. Like they just didn't even believe it. Some people would not even understand or realize that there were gangs in Denver. So, you know, for all of these reasons, of course, were, were things. And, and, you know, as a journalist, one of the things for sure was not only problematic, but sort of disillusioning for me, but sort of felt important was that I mean, it felt like ultimately, and I say it in the book, that it felt like an alternate history of a neighborhood and a shooting case. And that shooting case, just to add a couple extra details, you realizing to contextualize it, but you know, the, the night before Terrence was supposed to move into this big boys and girls club that he'd campaigned for on this, um, on this Holly Square lot, uh, he was attacked um, by gang members some of whom turned out to have significant relationships with the police. None of this has still ever been reported in Denver except for in my book in the documentary. In fact, if you'd read everything about the case, you would understand something completely different happened, that he was the aggressor and that he was flew off the handle, had slipped back into gang life, was doing X, Y, or Z and lost his temper and went after this guy and, and shot this boy. Well, yeah. That, that's quite a different story than what happened. And indeed, as Terrence said, many of the uh, people involved, or at least let's say some of them appeared in the media, of course, speaking their side of the story. We were talking earlier about the media coverage of the redevelopment, which we'll probably get more into. But uh, you know, in that case, the coverage of the redevelopment was being done by one of the principal developers under his byline in the community newspaper. And of course, it didn't include all the opposition voices which Terrence was probably leading, um, uh, I mean, and uh, what, what was going on. So he had become someone who clearly kind of knew too much and wouldn't shut up and was the guy that they needed to get out of the picture as this whole thing was coming to fruition. And the way to ultimately do that, because they tried many other ways, and ultimately it culminated in this attack, and um, the result of it was that Terrence shot back. And uh, and so anyway, that was a mystery that took me. You know, it's been se uh, eight, seven years by, of work to get the book out. It was it's now eight. The movie's just coming out. I should mention actually to those of you who are in the area that it will be at the Denver Film Festival in November. And uh, so please come see it if you're if you're interested. Okay, thank you. If we could stay with you for a moment, Julian, if you could talk about. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if ethics is the way to, to phrase it. Um, I don't want to put it into this $10 word, but if you could talk about, um, especially as a, a white person, and the balance um, uh, that you had to make between being a professional journalist, telling the story, uh, working so closely with Terrence, getting to the truth or truths, <laughs> and um, thinking about safety, your safety, Terrence's safety, and also thinking about naming of people because you name just about everybody, <laughs> right? The naming. Very few pseudonyms. <laughs> Thank you. The naming thing, you know, and the, well, I'll get, come back to that at the end, but that, there, there was a lot of discussions with the publisher's lawyers about all of this, by the way, and 
ultimately they felt it was, and I agreed, that that those people who are named were also um, who are exposed in in ways that they don't want to be, but they were also working under publicly funded programs and presenting themselves as someone else. And I agreed that that was cause for naming them, calling them out as what they actually are, if they're going to take taxpayer money to do their work. Um, but in any case, yes, it was very hard, you know, coming. Um, from my background and trying to do a story like this, I knew it would be hard. And it was even harder than I thought because it got deeper and deeper in terms of like how, you know, there's a lot in the story about not only dangerous people, powerful people, influential people, but also, as mentioned, people who are acting in ways who that is for someone else. They're working for the police secretly. There's a lot of like, subterfuge <laughs> going on um, and so of course it was like it was on the one hand trying to stay safe which was not always easy because he couldn't control it but on the other hand like I was basically trying to gain the trust of people who probably haven't trusted people like me and even didn't trust the Denver media and one thing that helped was that I wasn't really the traditional media and I think that partly helped but the other thing that I really think was like making it work was that like I just kept showing up over and over and over and was there and like I hope you know earn the trust of people whose trust I needed of course because ultimately the story that's told it, many people did risk their lives to tell this story I mean that's the reality and once I think people hoped that I could be a someone who could help get this story out I mean because in the aftermath of it for example I've had people come up to me in tears telling me they thought the never story would never be told, thanking me, hugging me. And so, you know, at some point, people have to decide whether or not to trust people. And then, you know, I have to also, as a journalist, I mean, ultimately my job is to get like as deep as I can into a story and then I have to pull all the way out too in order to write it. And, you know, and Terrence can add to this from his side, but, you know, we, he and I went through lots of, um, tension at various times because, and as a journalism professor, by the way, I'll just say one thing I do with my students is I make them interview each other for a story because I want them to feel what it's like to be interviewed and have a story about you written. Well, of course, you're anytime you're being interviewed, and this is one, it's also because I need them to know like when they're hearing answers from people, those answers, number one, are coming from what this person wants the person to hear, whether or not it's true. And these are, there's all these things you have to think about, of course, when you're, you know, first becoming a journalist. But it's also, you know, that there's a lot of power in that's it, then in my hands. And then I had the reality that like I was developing, you know, friendships, relationships. And I was even in the midst and, well, in the regular contact in some cases of people that ultimately I didn't trust, you know, and I knew that at some point they were going to learn that and I had to actually pretend I didn't know it for a while because in order for the story to play out. And so that's very hard and sort of scary at times. Um, and there's some of those people I haven't even heard from or seen. And so there, it was complicated. It was a complicated thing. And I, and I did, even though Terrence is the main subject in, of the book, he, he had to also accept that um, I was gonna talk to everyone and not just do that, but do record searches. I would, did all kinds of um, records requests on everyone, including Terrence. And so um, that's how I operated. I tried, you know, to, because I've also been, a, there's been an ocean of falsehoods that goes kind of deeper into the story of what's happened after it's come out. But people have claimed things, and one of the things that's often been claimed is, oh, I was paying Terrence, and it's a fake story or whatever. That's not true. Um, I tried to hold the line as a journalist, and it was a very complicated, difficult story. Terrence, would you would you like to talk about that? Julian mentioned your name, that you could add something to that. Just, I guess, from your perspective, working with someone who was right there alongside you, and that at some point uh, you got your public defender, your your attorney, to get to allow Julian to sit in on your meetings with your attorney who was going to defend your life, basically. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said earlier, of course, like I needed an outside perspective to help get my voice out. 
But then as the years went on and he was reporting and I knew that he was hanging out with my detractors, of course, it did become a thing like, hey, <laughs> what are you talking to them for? You already know what they have to say about me. And he's like, well, Terrence already told you I have to include everybody's voice. And so, yeah, I did disagree a couple times, but then I was going through my own dramas and traumas and I was having to heal from what happened to me and I'm, I became a home inspector. So I'm fresh out of someone's crawl space and I got mud on my face and I'm getting a text message from Julian like, hey, I just had to go talk to these guys. I'm like, what the hell are you doing over there? You know what I mean? So, and I, and I had to learn myself that, you know, Julian does not, he, does, he, did, he doesn't work for me. And this is not a puff piece on Terrence Roberts. Like, there's going to be things you see in the book that are hard for me to see about my own character and my own personality, especially at that time, you know. But it all had to come out because I'm not ashamed of myself either, you know. But I'm not a perfect person, but it's like, hey, this is who I am. So that's why I allowed him to tell the story, and I did agree to him with him to do it. And when it wasn't going my way, that doesn't mean, oh, deal over because you don't do what I like because I already knew after meeting him, I was like, well, I'm going to do it anyways. So he, he was going to finish any, whether I wanted him to or not, because that's what was his job was. Uh, then as far as my attorneys go, they were as good attorneys. They should have been against me, of course, having a journalist in the room. Of course, I understood that. But I knew that these guys attacked me, and I knew that it was going to come out eventually that I was attacked when there were over 100 people in the area I mean, at least someone's going to e eventually say that what happened. And we're not talking about one person or two people. Like, dozens of gang members attacked me. So, and it's on camera, you know. So I, I, I was very confident in my chances at winning a trial. So I didn't have a problem with Julian being in there. I didn't have anything to hide, even the bad stuff. Because I didn't make all the perfect decisions during that moment either. But even that, I was like, well, as long as people see I was attacked, I'm fine with that. Now we're here. And by the way, I agree. The agreement was that I would not publish or you know put or or put anything out out on camera of anything before the trial was over. Other reporters, of course, were reporting on a daily basis, but I was not. Um, but yeah, of course, it was. Yeah, it, 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 I could have ended up being a witness because I, he, I, it broke his attorney-client privilege for me to be in the room. But he thought it was important, and I was happy to be there because it, there. Are, and when you see the movie and read the book, there are some scenes and things. That I got that were quite dramatic to see happen in real time. That going in his case. Let me say this too. My now my attorneys after we won they threw a huge party, and now they're happy that the documentary is coming out. So I think we're all happy I did make that decision, um, but it ended up being a good decision. Thank you. So in the epilogue, I know it's in the end. I'm just not sure if it's the final chapter or the epilogue. Uh, Jillian, you write about uh, Terrence has this idea, so this question is actually to you, Terrence. The urban war industrial complex. I would love to hear more about that. It was almost, because it was an epilogue, correct? Yes, and uh, it was almost like, oh, is, is, there, is there another book coming to talk about this? Why is it only first mentioned in the epilogue? <laughs> so Terrence, if you could talk about that, what, what, is, what is that? Well, just like, no one in this room heard of the war industrial complex until the 90s. We're talking about the 90s weren't that far away, guys. Um, we, we didn't know about the Iran-Contra scandal where our own government has literally admitted pumping tons and tons of cocaine into California and into Miami to destabilize black communities to fund guerrilla fighters somewhere that's not even in the United States, but they would destabilize people of color to fund another cause, okay? This happened um, the same way that Julian uncovered what we are calling the urban war industrial complex. There's money in war. There's money for certain people in conflict. There's money to keep black people and white people against each other, white people and Latino people against each other, blacks and Latinos. There is money in Denver having 96 homicides every year. I'm going to just give you simple economics. I want everybody in here to just think about this. What if Denver, Colorado had two homicides next year? It, it, it is simple economics to say, well, for the past two or three years, we've only had five homicides. We don't need 1,500 officers patrolling the streets. We need 1,500 officers patrolling the streets if there's 96 homicides, because now it's a dangerous place. 
We don't want you to think it's a dangerous place, but we kind of know it is a dangerous place. There's no reason why Denver should have 96 homicides. Every person in this room has seen way worse than Denver, Colorado, right here in America, let alone in other countries. We're talking about for real danger. It can get dangerous in Denver if you are a youth in a street gang, but these are children and young people and mainly uh, some of our unhoused neighbors are having conflicts. We can do better than that and there is a belief and it has been proven through Julian's reporting and other forms of reporting that there is an urban war industrial complex and that needs to be discussed because just like there's war in Iraq, just like there's war in the Ukraine, there's war in Northeast Park Hill right now. There could be a youth murdered in Denver tonight. It could be two or three. There could be a youth murdered in Detroit, murdered in South Central LA, and there are elements of people who should be stopping the violence, who they're just, there's just evil people in all different forms of government, organizations. Not everyone's perfect, but there are people benefiting off of the youth, off, off of the death of youth of color, and it's not just black and Latino youth too. Working class white male youths are one of the largest demographics of kids joining street gangs, and a lot of them are African American or Latino street gangs. These are Googleable facts. I was going to say that. Uh, it, so, Terrence and I started talking about this term uh, some time into the reporting I was doing because it seemed so evident, and it was you know related to like a concept people could understand. But it is true. But I, to, to, to put it another way, I would say that when you look at crime statistics or actually, like, for, let's take murders, um, in a place like Denver, in a place like a lot of cities, number one, a, a majority of them are happening in certain neighborhoods, right? And those neighborhoods are also, in almost every case, vulnerable minority neighborhoods in which there are significant police operations going on. And the question is, are those operations working? And how are the, those, how, how is their success measured? And, or are they not working? And for example, in Northeast Park Hill, those operations have been going on for decades. But the, con the violence continues to, of course, it does sometimes go up and down. In general, it's been going up. And, but the success of the programs is measured not by that, but by the number of arrests. So the arrests feed a system that is our criminal justice industrial complex, and this urban war industrial complex that we're ta talking about is just a part of it. And sure enough, the reason we don't understand much about these, the crime in these neighborhoods is not a mistake. That's exactly how these you know, uh, law enforcement would want it. Um, I look at crimes that are happening, we both often talk about one example well, that was a mass shooting that happened right in Holly Square, didn't even make the papers. Usually one, a murder or not something, oh, there's a few lines about it. This one, nope, not even any. A mass shooting right here, guess what? It involved all these well-known people in gangs, some of them <laughs> also working for law enforcement. and. There's ways that the media is, you know, throwing off the scent, helping law enforcement, whatever. The, re the reality is we don't hear about it because people who are making a living off of it would rather we don't understand it. And yes, this is, a, this is just another example of, you know, the, the, the rise in crime benefiting the, the system. Um, many people who would read the book, many activists who would read the book, they would see evidence for abolishing the criminal justice system as it stands, or at the least abolishing the police aspect of it. But once you abolish that, it would happen. You say many people reading the book would, would ask for that. You said activists and Acti people reading activists, the book? activists. I guess other people. Many because uh, I, I yes. Go many ahead. activists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I, what, I threw that in after. The, I'm like, wait, not maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> I can't say that for sure. But I would imagine many activists, many uh, progressive activists, Black Lives Matter yeah. activists, those types of activists, um, would see in the book evidence for their case of either defund the police or. Um, abolishing the police or the criminal legal system as a whole. So, Terrence, 
what are your thoughts about that? The abolishment or defunding? So, you know, as a civil rights African-American organizer, I've hosted dozens of events. <laughs> I, I've been arrested, I've been assaulted by the police, all of these things are documented. Um, I just also told you guys that we had 96 homicides in Denver last year. I mean, let's, let's be practical and let's be sensible. I, I, I don't, and, and, I, and I have arguments with other well-known uh, African-American activists, and you know, there's like a lot of other white people who are, you know, communist and socialist, because I don't like to put any political label on myself, okay? But these are friends of mine, and they are saying, oh, we need to abolish the police. And then my question is, well, you know Jasmine Hernandez's body got found on Colfax in Quebec, this 17-year-old Latina who was murdered. This just happened, just so you all in this crowd know. But I didn't see any socialist out there. I didn't see one communist out there. We had 11,000 people downtown when George Floyd got killed. That was great. We even did an after party. Everybody smoked weed, drunk coffee, it was great. It was a party. But what about Jasmine Hernandez? So if we do abolish the police, what if my sister's boyfriend is beating her up at two o'clock in the morning? Can I, can I call you guys? I guarantee you I can't even call you if my tire needs changing at two in the morning. Not to disparage our, our friends, but if, if the first people who are going to lose if we abolish the police, are African Americans and primarily African American women. Then Latinos, you're next. People from, from India, if you're here, if you have a community, you're next, okay? Let's be, let's be honest, okay? Then we'll get to the poor white people. You're, you're right behind us. Then the few rich white people who may live in Boulder and some enclaves, you'll figure it out, but It'll suck living that way, okay? Because you, you will be in an enclave all to yourself if you survive it. I, I do not advocate for defund, well, I do not, so defund the police is more of a term of reallocate the police. There are federal laws that say per capita for cities, you can't, you have to have a certain amount of policing, just so you guys know. So you can't just defund the police, you cannot just, but there are ways where you can reallocate money to where it's almost like you defund the police. My thing is this, I'm not saying we need to defund, but do we need to have an audit of our public safety um, departments? Absolutely. If there's five or six million dollars that the police were just hanging on to for batons and basketball games, we'll take that five or six million dollars. I guarantee you there's a homeless shelter, a domestic violence center, a youth violence center that could use this five or six million dollars. If you look at Denver, Denver police are too involved with our media. They're married, they're dating, they're having fun together. Denver police are too involved with municipal matters on what the mayor's office should be saying where this money should go, not the, not the fraternal order of police. You get a paycheck. You already get paid 90000 a year. Why do you care if this domestic violence shelter gets an extra $2 million that you're hoarding? So are we, do I advocate for abolishing the police? No, I'm not stupid, okay? I think that is stupid because people are getting uh, murdered. Women are getting raped. Women of all hues are getting raped. Not just black and brown women, white women are getting raped too. There is a problem with domestic violence and anger in America, especially since COVID. What happens when people need someone to come help them? I'm also an advocate for the STAR program. If someone's having a mental health breakdown and they're arguing with their mother, that doesn't mean the police need to come shoot them 15 times. We can send a mental health advocate. Now, if this guy runs at the mental health advocate with a machete, okay, we'll call the police. But in the STAR program, thousands of calls were made for mental health um, distress services in the last couple of years in Denver. Not even one of those calls it, it um, became someone who was murdered or got hurt or even had to go to jail for assaulting a star worker. A mental health breakdown is different from someone robbing a bank come with hostages. We need to reimagine how policing is done and we need to use all of that money, effort, all of those guns that the police have and all of this energy. We need to make sure that people are being protected, okay? Not people are just getting assaulted and getting pushed around because they can't afford a $1,800 a month rent for a studio apartment. 
we can do better in Colorado, we could do better in Denver. Thank you. My final question to you all before we open it up to the audience, to both of you, is since the book has come out, since the book came out, what has the response been, just in general, you mentioned a little bit earlier, and have changes, positive changes, been made, whether it's with the police department, with that development that's going on in the Holly, um, or its surrounding areas, and so forth? Well, um, yeah, there's been a lot of interesting things that have happened since the uh, book came out, including me uh, leaving my home for many months. Uh, but, um, uh, and that's serious, because there was um, threats, and um, there was also, um, there's been uh, actually from certain quarters an ocean of falsehoods about the book, me, the movie, the project in general, and to the point where I'm calling it out like all the time now, because I just, what's interesting to me I'll say is that the reaction to the book has been as revealing as the findings in the book. Like the cover up is like too obvious. Um, and you know, who's saying things and you know, it, to me it was like, and especially if some of you get to see the documentary soon, what was so amazing about being in the middle of what was, what I ended up able to capture on camera was that it, it was revealing itself. And it, it, like, I mean, I did do a lot of investigative work throughout the process. And, um, but some of the things that were kind of important uh, in terms of figuring out what was going on, actually kind of just the people kind of revealed themselves whether they were trying to or not. Um, and so that's been one thing. I mean, I should also, I, I, of course, I'm always told and try, I, people have to remind me <laughs> that, yes, there's been some good things, obviously. I mean, I was, it was great. We won the Colorado Book Award. I won the Colorado Book Award for general nonfiction. That was cool. Um, it was the New York Times, Editor's Choice. It's gotten you know national and local media and um, has been successful yet. Actually, what is often interesting, at the, we were at the Denver Press Club a couple of weeks ago for an event, and talking about how interesting it is who wasn't there. And I would say the same about sort of who, in terms of what has happened since, in terms of any rea uh, reactions. Uh, there's been a few, and I guess I'll keep their names out for specifically, but one of our state, one of our senators is, has the book is mandatory reading in his house, you know, and um, the, the governor has written me a personal note and all that, but um, I, I don't think that the mayor or any of the people who are directly over the things that are revealed as highly problematic in the book, I, I'm not sure that any of them have read it and they've certainly uh, not been able to comment on it. So um, that's actually, there's going to be some efforts to, to you know, um, get them to have to respond to a few things coming up soon, and uh, we'll see. I mean, they're very good at ignoring things, obviously. Um, and so that's been a little disappointing, but not surprising. So there's not going to be a Denver one read of the Holly anytime soon, is that what? <laughs> exactly. For the city? Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, there, there will Just not be. <laughs> no. Terrence. Yeah, it's kind of been the Denver don't read for that, <laughs> that, that crowd of people. You know, um, I mean, and Julian alluded to it, of course there are detractors, but, you know, really the biggest question I'm getting from the community is, how much did he pay you, of course, and he didn't pay me one dollar, one cent. I benefit because a true narrative was told about what happened to me, and I get to come talk to and meet amazing people like you guys and come to JLF conferences and things like that. Um, and that's my payment, is my life, is my physical life and my, my freedom, I'm free right now, and I do think that even Julian's involvement really straightened people out, because in Denver, like I said, there, there's one big machine, and um, you know, the fix was in on me, so now that people see a true narrative about what happened to me, and that I wasn't just going crazy, um, that, that's a, like a positive reception, but it has its detractors, but our detractor pool is getting so, it's looking so small right now. I mean, this is a journalist, he didn't just write his own, what he thought, he had his own thoughts he kind of put in, but he wrote what my grandmother told him. He wrote what people, he, even my detractors told him. He wrote what I told him, and this is what came out of it. And now that people are being able to see 
a different side of the reporting, I'm getting very positive feedback from it. Uh, it it's working well for me, so. Good afternoon. I just wanted to thank both of you. In an era of um, so much fake news, it's refreshing to sit here and listen to your story, which is so courageous, and to commend you both on what you've done in writing this book and doing this documentary. And it sounded like Julian's been uh, running from the people who are not happy about this. But Terrence, I'm curious what has your experience been? Because it sounds like he's had a very negative experience and yet um, I'm curious the gang members, people who might have come after you, um, what's happening in that respect? I mean, they're still, they're still slandering me. They're still, I've had episodes where they've gone online like, Terrence is a big snitch. And I'm like, oh yeah, really? Because I'm kind of hard-headed still when it comes to that stuff. Because I'm not against gang members. I'm not against the police. I'm against people who are bullying people. And I really don't like to get bullied myself. I don't like the feeling of being bullied. I went through that in middle school. And I'm 46 years old. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, there's a whole book about you working for the FBI. And you're an active gang member. Matter of fact, since my Facebook works, how about I put this on my Facebook? So I, I, we've had those discussions since the book came out. And I'm going to still stand up for myself. I'm going to still stand up for my community. And this is the gang. I built that gang. <laughs> my grandmother fed the gang. Like, I shed blood for that gang. I know these guys. I grew up with these guys. And I know their limitations and how dangerous they are and, and what. So I kind of know the city. I know the pulse of the community. So I, and, you know, and there's times where I keep my mouth shut, too. I, I read things online and people are slandering me or going in on me. And there's whole conversations. And I don't just hop on every time I see something. Um, there's times where I'm cautious about where I go. There's times where I have security. You know, I mean, I'm a very public person. I have to go certain places, and there may be people there. We've hired security. We've hired police officers to defend me, you know, for, for what I'm doing now. You know, so um, I, I, I'm just smart about the things that I do, and I don't, I don't go hang out at after-hours parties where I know it's full of gang members and it's 3 in the morning and stuff like that. Because eventually enough of that, I probably would have been murdered. So, you know, I just, I just move smart. Um, I go to positive places, and I'm doing other things in my life to where those guys... Unless we're talking about the book, they, they don't even, they're not even anywhere close to the stuff that we're doing right now. So. Question here? Oh, no, can you wait for the microphone? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, right here. Hey there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm kind of stringing together a couple of things and listening to you folks talk about um, the book and definitely having heard and read so much about this book in the last couple of months just living in Denver. Um, and and also thinking about the experiences on the street in 2020, you know, what it was like to be there protesting, to have seen something so visibly wrong, you know. I, I think what is so fascinating about this book is it, it really falls in line with a lot of the kind of hard lessons a lot of people learned in 2020 about copaganda and community sort of journalism. You know, it's important that when somebody is being yelled at by the police, you turn that cell phone camera on, you know, you turn that video on. And I was wondering kind of how you see, you know, the spectrum here of the kind of the work that, I mean, like myself, I was constantly recording, constantly playing, you know, recording audio at the protests. And then you have these, you know, big, big cases where the protesters sued the police department in Denver and, and win for brutality and, and, and violating civil rights. You know, where do you see that kind of, does it start in the community and find this kind of elevated jo uh, voice, which is a written word or... Is it, is it possible, is it necessary all of us get into writing books? Or, you know, uh, it's, well, it's, I mean, there's that's a only one avenue yeah. because uh, as I already noted, there's not been a lot of uh, progress on some of the issues that I, I'd like to see progress on. One of which, by the way, is oversight. I just want to mention that because I thought about it before. Um, but you know, you're, I'm also you're on the stage here now as someone who's in, 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 not part of the lawsuit that you probably read about, but it is currently suing the police for misconduct and targeting him during the 2020 protests. And I, I, I usually have, you know, laughed about the fact that I missed my book deadline by about two years, but thank God, because 
the whole end of the book would have been missed. 2020 was an incredibly interesting year in Terrence's life and, of course, in the country, in the world, but um, because of all of what happened after George Floyd's murder. And Terrence ended up, you know, as some of you know, being arrested. He was, you know, co-leader of the Justice for Elijah McClain movement. He was out there all the time, and he did end up getting, uh, uh, was it pepper sprayed? Or, and, and, and then it was also... He and then yeah he was arrested for uh, all kinds of charges uh, that were totally souped up and ridiculous for the peaceful protest he was at for specifically not wanting to allow you know any of these um, oh just violence into the into the protest but then was acu- arrested and accused of it and it was just the cycle again continues of the activism and targeting of activists and the violence and and all of it but I mean in terms of sort of how to, I don't know, get the message out. I just think like, you know, journalism is a is hugely important one, but sadly it's sort of like, if anything, like diluted now, but in terms of its importance, there's just so many ways. So any way you can think of is great, but I'm, I think it's, obviously it's changed everything. The fact that we can, on our phone, record something like George Floyd being murdered and suddenly the entire world is protesting. So great, record everything you can, all that you want, Pick your your lane and 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 go for it because there's many avenues that need to be sort of addressed. Yeah, and I agree with that. But we need somebody who's going to record it properly. We need somebody who's going to have the bullhorn. It, it's a team effort. Like, and that's when the people get involved. That's when they get afraid because. You only get those kind of movements. The last time we had a movement like the tw- 19, um, in 2020 was in the 1960s. It was kind of like recreate 68 almost. You know, everybody always says that, but 2020 was recreate 68. And we needed journalists. I, I, I feel personally, I'm going to say it for him, like, in his own way, Julian kind of saved the journalism. Because like you, ma'am, I'm like, you know, uh, that is one term that I kind of bought borrowed from Donald Trump too is like fake media but if I was Donald Trump I wouldn't want any media to exist all the things he's doing right but there there is fake media and I'm, I'm a victim of fake media so we do need somebody who's not even a journalist to say I'm just gonna stand right here that was a young teenage African-American woman who stood there for for 10 minutes recording George Floyd with that knee on his neck for eight minutes and what 49 seconds or something like that that was a child who stood there and said, nope, I'm not turning my phone off. I'm going to stand here and do this, which kicked off an international movement, not just for policing in America, but policing worldwide. The conversation is out there. And like I said, uh, there's a lot of... uh, Every gang member who I've ever met who's been shot and they couldn't get to the hospital, I guarantee you, I'd be like, well, what'd you do next? I called the police. (laughs) You sure did. (laughs) You're going to die, right? Yeah, you are hurting bad. So... You know, man, it's not about being against the police. It's about if you're hurting somebody, we need you to record it. We need Terrence to be experienced enough to lead the crowd. We need people to show up to fill the crowd. And we need people who know what they're doing to keep people safe, but to get the, to get the point across that we're not going to stand for any kind of abuse, um, no matter if it's coming from gang members, the police, your husband, your brother, your kids. No one should be hurting anybody so whatever anybody in this crowd could do to help somebody out if you know someone's getting abused, if it's recorded on your phone, if it's called a police, if it's a man standing up to another man because he's hurting a woman or a child or, or an animal, I say do it and whatever happens, that's what, that's what God wanted to happen, but that's what you're called to do. Hey everybody, uh, just w- wanted to thank all three of you for coming, and uh, I'll say I didn't even know what this book was, and now I will certainly be buying it, so you know, thank you for uh, having that. Uh, so my first question is, are you selling the book here, and will you sign it? And uh, the second question, there you go. And the second question I think is, uh, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm a very solutions-driven person, so I think I'm trying, I'm trying to grasp this problem, and I'm thinking like, are there other organized communities, or cities, or even other countries that seem to be moving the goalpost on this like immensely complex problem of like prison industrial complex or police you know minority relations or anything i'd I'd love to hear if you guys have made any kind of progress or any had any uh, interactions in that realm so yeah that that's a because see like all of these issues are kind of interconnected you know you've been hearing the term it's like a buzzword intersectionality 
lately, but when we're talking about policing, a lot of that also has to do with housing. When we're talking about violence, that has to do with housing, policing. So all of these things kind of intersect, but there's different, like Houston has the best housing model for a city the size of Houston, but Houston does not have the best anti-violence model. You understand what I'm saying? You know, so, you know, like we'll look to cities like Houston. We, we have delegates that are from Denver right now who just went to Houston who should have been doing what Houston was doing 10 years ago. We should have been doing it 10 years ago, but now we're just now trying it. Um, but then there's other cities like Los Angeles. They're starting to see kind of a rise in gang violence, but man, we're talking about Watts, which is one of the most dangerous communities in America still to this day. They have many years where all of the Crips and Bloods and housing developments agreed to a ceasefire, and it, and it came from within the community. That doesn't mean the police stopped patrolling. That means they didn't need 500 extra police because the community said, no, we know each other. Because really, if you beat up little Timmy for no reason, even though we're all gang members, but our moms do love us, and now the whole community is going to come against you, now we're mad. We're just going to go kill one of them, too. Because now we're just mad. Because that's the energy that it brings. Um, but there's different models in different cities that we are looking to for different things that, are, that we're all being affected. And some cities are, are better than others. And that's what I tried to bring to Denver. Um, these different models I was seeing from going to these different places and say, you know what, we can do that better here, here in Denver. We could do that housing model better in Denver, and we can do this better in Denver. And when we did it, it, it started working. We lowered homicides in Denver significantly um, for a few year span. And, and really, you can pretty much mark until the day I was attacked, homicides almost from right before that day have just been climbing. We're, we're on track right now in Denver to have over 100 homicides this year. So. Thank you. Uh, I did read the book. I got a lot out of it, and I thank you for writing it. Um, Terrence, you sound like a man running for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you are. Hear my, you hear my campaign in there without me saying, you guys know I'm running for mayor, right? But uh, yeah, yeah. I, try not to, I try not to use the book platform to announce that, but I, I am the protagonist of the book, and yes, I am running for mayor, but I try to, if I can, I try not to mention it. So. Okay, great. So uh, my question is, you mentioned the, uh, I think it's the urban war industrial complex. Like, what are you going to do about it? I mean, so, you know, well, since I was asked about my platform now, is really what I've been talking about. We do need, so, you know, people don't like the term public housing because they think of the Cabrini Greens in Chicago. You know, they think about other public structures that were made in the 1940s, which were mainly military ba barracks, barracks for African Americans and people working on railroad systems, highway systems. But no, we do need more social housing in the city of Denver. We need more social housing anywhere where there is a housing problem. We do have to have a housing first model. I believe that housing is a human right. The reason why people are angry, it goes to show it is scientifically proven. Domestic violence increases, animal abuse increases, alcoholism increases, cocaine and fentanyl use increases. When people cannot pay their rent or when people don't know where they're going to lay their head. That's anybody in this room. If you didn't know what, where you were going to eat in two hours or if, if, you, uh, if you were going to have to sleep outside in Boulder. So we're definitely going to work on our housing first because in Denver, Colorado, see Denver's not New Orleans or, uh, or, or um, Philadelphia. We can wrap our minds around our 96 homicides. A lot of our homicides are connected to our, our, our housing issue. Not to say homeless people are committing crimes. There is some of that, of course, but a lot of our kids in Denver are semi-homeless. You don't have to be living in a tent on Colfax and Broadway to be homeless. There's levels to homelessness. If you're sleeping in someone's basement, and as soon as they have a mental health breakdown, or they may be bipolar, or just tired of hearing your music, if they tell you, get the hell out of my basement, guess what? You're homeless. You better hope there's room in that shelter, or you're going to have to snuggle up somewhere warm until 6 o'clock in the morning and figure it out that next day. Some, some people have only had to sleep outside two or three days, but they had to sleep outside and didn't know where they were going. So we're going to wrap our minds around our homelessness issue. We have no youth centers in Denver. We have recreation centers, which can be used by anybody, but we need more targeted youth centers in Denver. Okay, we need to focus on all forms of violence. Denver has a huge domestic violence problem. 
Bet you never heard that before. Denver has a large animal abuse issue. This is a cold weather state, guys. You can't leave your dogs outside and it's 20 degrees outside. Your freezer is at 40 degrees, okay? You can't leave five animals in a cage and it's 20 degrees outside. You're murdering them. There's, we, our public safety budget in Denver for just this year is 365 days a year. It's, 60, it's $566 million. Only 2% of that goes to housing. Our public safety budget in Denver is 39% of our general fund, which is $1.49 billion. This is a, Denver is a fully developed city, okay? It is not a poor city. There's over 19,400 cities in America. Some cities are bankrupt. Denver is the exact opposite of bankrupt. We have the money, we just need to restructure how our public safety budget is done, and I know for a fact, we've done it with no money. <laughs> we've done it with grants, so that's, that's just a, a short spill of, we're gonna really focus first on housing. We only have time for one very quick question. <laughs> okay. um, I really liked, Terrence, how you described your relationship to Park Hill when you were a young kid kind of this matriarchal society. And one of my favorite parts of the book is really the, or not favorite, but I think a heartwarming part of the book, which is not a feel-good book, um, is really the, the beginning where you, um, Julian, talk about the, the history of Park Hill and those young couples moving into Five Points and moving into Park Hill and building homes and families and jobs. And that is really, it, it, it was very heartwarming to read. Um, so I was just, and the book really then uncovers all the pressures that come to bear on the youth in Park Hill, um, the corruption, the development, all those layers, um, the police interaction with the gangs. So uh, all of that that creates kind of an explosive situation. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, Terrence, if you could speak a little bit about your relationship to Park Hill today, right? Like beyond the redevelopment on steroids that is going on in the neighborhood. Like, how do you feel about your Park Hill today? And how would you describe it? So it did go from almost nearly 100% African American, now it's like maybe 33% African American, which in today's society, that's really high <laughs> percentage actually still. So um, it, it's still probably the most, you know, dense as far as African American communities in the, st in the state of Colorado is probably that sector of Northeast Park Hill um, where you'll still see African Americans walking around, riding their bikes. So you'll see from gang members to African American police to African American scholars and doctors. So it's still all there in Park Hill. Um, you know, my relationship in Park Hill is of course I have maybe that 2% who side with these guys who Julian had to report on because um, they're bloods. And, and, and it's more than, oh, they're just a stupid street gang. It is a tribal thing to where even people who've never been involved with gangs, they'll do community events and be like, oh, Park Hill is red, and that community is blue, <laughs> you know? And these are people who don't, because of these kids who are wearing it, because it's their kids. And I was one of them, so um, there is a, a small group of people who are, who are like, ah, oh, Terrence Roberts, we don't like him, we don't like that book, we don't like Julian. But that, that community is small compared to, I mean, f so for right now, with my, even he, this gentleman brought up my campaign, but I mean, pretty much the entire community of at least Northeast Park Hill um, and a lot of South Park Hill, they all got my back. They're, they're ready, they're gearing up for me. I'm a fair elections candidate. We had to get 250 donations to qualify for our Times 9 payout. It was a bunch of really elderly African Americans from Park Hill who had my back and supported me. So even Bloods and Crips made donations, doctors, <laughs> lawyers, white people. So I have the most diverse campaign, and um, we're doing good, man. We're very confident. We're rocking, and a lot of that love came from Northeast Park Hill. Okay, that's thank you so much.